Welcome everyone, my name is Ben Gerretta, I'm the Chair of the London branch of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators uh, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all today to this joint webinar between the London branch and the LCIA and the topic of today's webinar is Green ADR. I'm going to pass over in a moment to the uh, moderator Nicholas Stewart QC uh, but just, just to mention two points. Firstly, um, this webinar is being recorded uh, and a video will be made available uh, at a later date. Uh, and secondly, if you have any questions um, during the webinar, if you can put them in the Q&A uh, box, then you'll see at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A button uh, to, to bring up that section of the Zoom um, uh, software. Uh, so uh, I'd like to pass over now to Nicholas Stewart QC, who is the Vice Chair of the London Branch and who's going to be moderating this webinar. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Ben. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here. Um, actually, I'm not delighted to be here, really, because I'm stuck at home like everybody else. But you, you know what I mean. I'm, I'm delighted to be with you all uh, on, on a, an intellectual excursion. We've got an absolutely fantastic panel. Um, we've, um, we've, I'm, I'm not going to say very much at all. Um, we've agreed that I'm not going to go through all their bios and so on, but you can read their impressive bios on the flyer. Actually, the only person who hasn't got a bio is, is, is poor old Ben. So, well, he's neither poor nor old, but, but he hasn't got a bio. But, but you can Google him because, you know, there's, there's only one Ben Geretta. You'll, you'll, you'll find him there. So, OK. So, um, but uh, there, there is, uh, but I'm not going to sing again because, you know, my clerk wouldn't allow me to sing twice in a day for no fee. But um, I, I'm going to go straight. What I'm going to do is introduce each of the five as, as we get to them. So um, there's only one Lucy Greenwood. And um, Lucy's an independent international arbitrator now, a Greenwood arbitration. And she's very active in the Green Pledge. I think I detect a theme there, actually. Uh, so I'm going to go straight to Lucy. Lucy's going to give us an intro. And then we're going to have another, another uh, intro from um, Anna Howard. And, and then we'll move on. So Lucy, straight away, over to you. Thanks very much, Nick, and good afternoon, good morning, everyone, wherever you are. It's just so inspiring to see so many people attending um, this seminar on looking at arbitrating in a more and, and mediating in a more environmentally friendly manner. And Nick's asked me just to set the scene a little bit for you before we go into uh, the more interactive discussion. And on that point, you know, please do do put your comments, thoughts, um, observations in the chat. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on them and picking them up as we can, as we go along. But let me set the scene about the Green Pledge, which began live a couple of years ago. It was a really a very small promise that I made on my um, website that I would try and arbitrate my disputes in a more environmentally friendly manner and encourage people um, appearing before me to do so as well. So why did this all come about? And as, as many of you on the call will know, I'm not shy about talking about it. I spent 10 very happy years living and working in Houston, Texas. And on a clear day in Houston, I could look out from my office in downtown and I could see the refineries all the way down on the Gulf Coast. And um, when you went away for a weekend, I was always thrilled driving back in on the freeway. I could see the nodding donkeys. I drove 30 miles to work every day. I had my lovely Dodge Grand Caravan minivan, which did about 10 miles to the gallon, and I happily filled up at less than three bucks a gallon. All my clients were energy companies, and all my work was hydrocarbons based. And, and I watched as my clients evolved, started to bring in ESG, environmental, social, and governance principles into their practices. And it kind of all just passed me by. I was, I thought, pretty environmentally conscious in my personal life. I recycled, I educated my kids, I, we talked about being green at home. But when it came to my work, really, that was somebody else's problem. I was there to arbitrate disputes, really not much more than that. And there's a fairly slight trite saying which is something along the lines of all we have to do is wake up and change and for me i woke up one day back in 2018 now when uh, i was chairing a major energy arbitration in houston and at the end of the two-week hearing I, I looked behind me at this wall of binders and i realized that not a single binder had been opened during the course of the hearing 
and I, I was chairing the case and to my credit I had we had encouraged the parties to produce electronic bundles but we had said that we would want a printed set in case the technology failed and I realized then that that wasn't good enough it so that led me to look into the available technology and to start to question why that arbitration that I was chairing in 2018 really looked very very similar to my first ever arbitration which was back in 1998 we were still running arbitrations in a very traditional very old-fashioned way and we we had all the technology available to us to change that but we weren't embracing paperless arbitrations we weren't using video conferencing to deliberate remotely. Uh, you would occasionally see it at a hearing if a witness really physically could not travel, but not a lot more than that. And the technology would help us to run arbitrations, I thought, more efficiently, more cost effectively, but also, very importantly, in a more environmentally friendly way. And we just we just weren't using it for any of those purposes so as i say from that my very small promise my green pledge as i called it um was was born and i then realized fairly shortly thereafter that that was fine for me as an arbitrator but that in fact that we should as a broader arbitration community really look at why we were talking about arbitrating climate change disputes. So we're talking about the law and the policy in relation to climate change at the sort of macro level, but we weren't looking at the micro level, the personal level, as members of the arbitration community, that the personal obligations that we have to look at our practices and to think about how we can reduce our impact on the environment. So the pledge evolved into this broader campaign for greener arbitrations and it I'm just so grateful for the people that have got behind it, one of whom being Michelle, who's been who's on the panel today and has been on the steering committee right from the outset. And is there a problem with the way international arbitrations is one are run? And that was really the question that we asked ourselves once we set up the campaign, set up the steering committee. And we knew that we were dealing with cynical lawyers on the whole. And so Michelle and her team set to and did a fantastically detailed environmental impact analysis of a major international arbitration. And because we knew we needed the data to convince people that there needed to be change. And there really does. There, are, there is no doubt that international arbitrations, particularly large international arbitrations, have an extremely significant environmental footprint and I don't I'm not going to take time now to go into too much detail of that um, but our headline figure is that it takes 20,000 trees to offset one major international arbitration and the vast majority of that as you would expect comes from flights and particularly business flights 93% of the emissions relate to flights so just to finish on the campaign and to just mention briefly before I hand it back to Nick, the, what the campaign is doing next. We have just launched our green protocols and these are ascended, intended to really help you make changes because we are very conscious that people have you know, great goodwill in terms of changing behavior but may not necessarily know exactly what to do so we have just launched um, six green protocols which are essentially for each major actor in the arbitration so there's a green protocol for arbitrators there's one for institutions there's one for law firms and so on and you can pull that off the shelf and look at it and see where there are changes that you can make that will make a difference because as i always say there is you may sit there and think that by not printing your bundles you won't be making a difference but you really will and similarly by deciding not to fly to interview a witness but to discuss the early stages of a witness statement by video conference instead you may think that won't make a difference it will because people will see that behavioral change and they will implement it it's, it's the butterfly wings um, uh, analogy in in a, 
in a certain sense. So that's really just setting the scene as where we are on the campaign. And let me hand over to Nick and then to Anna, who's going to talk, I think, about the mediation side of, of these, these efforts as well. Okay, no, that's great. Thank you, Lucy. That, that set the scene very nicely. And uh, we've got Dr. Anna Howard now. Uh, Anna, you, you, of course, you've got practical legal practice experience very widely and, and academic experience uh, as well. But as Lucy indicated, you, you're going to look at a little bit more from a mediation perspective now and talk about a, a different pledge set the scene for us there. Many thanks, okay. Nick, and many thanks, Lucy. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes. Apologies, the sun has suddenly arrived. So <laughs> after a morning of rain, I'm going to set the scene um, about the mediation pledge and explain how that came about, what we're seeking to achieve, and really what's next. So whilst mediation may have a lower environmental impact than other professions and other businesses, we can still make changes to minimise that impact. And perhaps as a community, mediators tend to think more about how they might mediate climate change issues than reflect on uh, their own contribution to climate change and their own behaviours and practices. So to borrow the words of Tolstoy, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing him or herself. It's so much more appealing and indeed easier to make changes without than within. So how did the pledge start? Well, it all started back in February 2020 when John Sturrock, who's very much been leading um, the, 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 the campaign for the, the mediation pledge, he wrote a post on the Clue Mediation blog. And in that he questioned, he posed the question about how we as mediators might come together to work to reduce our, our environmental impact. And coincidentally, I had met Lucy the night before at an event at Queen Mary University where Lucy was on a panel discussing a matter on arbitration. And through me meeting Lucy, I became aware of her remarkable work for the Campaign for Greener Arbitration. So I put Lucy and John in touch. And through that introduction, um, Lucy very graciously agreed that as we started work um, on, on drafting a pledge for the mediation community, that we could use the arbitration pledge as a starting point. So John's post generated a lot of comments, a lot of interest, and John suggested forming the World Mediators Alliance on Climate Change. And the first step was John invited everyone who had commented on his post to come together to form a working group to draft the pledge. And we were very lucky because this group, which formed organically, was comprised of people from all across the world, from different ages, different backgrounds. We had judges, mediators, academics, and lawyers. So we came together, COVID had just struck. We came together, had a lot of online meetings to discuss what we would cover in the pledge. And the central issue we kept returning to was how to strike the right balance, that we wanted the pledge to bring about meaningful change but we appreciate that if we set the bar too high, then that may simply discourage people and they may feel, well, those changes are not achievable, not attainable. So that was a central theme we, we kept coming back to. Um, just to give you a flavour of some of the provisions we focused on in the place, so as Lucy mentioned earlier, flying, so a key area where we can make significant change, travel. So we had some very lively discussions about whether we should use the word necessary or appropriate. So mediators should only fly when it's necessary to do so or when it's appropriate to do so and we ultimately decided on necessary because appropriate is a very easy standard to reach so if you ask yourself is it appropriate for me to do something it's quite easy to justify that behavior whereas if you ask yourself is it really necessary that's a far higher standard to to reach the pledge also encourages the use of online technology to conduct mediations. So many mediators have been forced to move their practices online as a result of COVID and they see that it works and it works well. However, in certain circumstances, an in-person mediation will be the better option. It will maybe the, the option that parties prefer. So we included wording uh, where appropriate, accessible and acceptable to all concerns. So acknowledging that there are times when the use of online technology may not be acceptable or appropriate. As with the arbitration pledge, we discourage the use of hard copies. So as Lucy mentioned, I've been in large commercial mediations in London and all the parties bring bundles of papers and those, those files are rarely opened. 
Choice of venue, we also encourage a mindful approach to the choice of venue. So this would include choosing a venue which may, um, may mean a lower amount of travel for, for the various parties, but also um, looking at the environmental impact of those particular venues. And you see now that more venues are actually marketing their green credentials because that's what, what clients are, are looking for. A slightly more polemical um, provision which we had in the pledge, um, and I'll share the words with you. In the rooms in which I am mediating, I will encourage where possible an environmentally friendly approach to consumables, for example, avoidance of single use plastics. So we've had some comments back uh, uh, on that provision, essentially saying, is that really my role as a mediator? Who am I to tell them whether or not they should be using plastic in those rooms? But I really think it's about how it's done. And I saw this done really well in my workplace last year when someone simply said, I don't like using plastic cups. There was a pile of plastic cups next to the water cooler. Could I have a glass? That single request led to ultimately the removal of all the plastic cups and the provision of glasses for everyone um, in that workplace. And uh, they have to wash them up. I'm not so good at doing that. But uh, it's an example of how small changes can lead to more significant change. The, the pledge is a work in progress. Um, I'm mindful of the words of my former formidable headmistress that the search for per perfectionism is often the enemy of achievement and there comes a point when you have to start doing rather than discussing however enjoyable our, our meetings were. So what's next? So we currently have 200 signatories to the pledge um, and it's wonderful to see that the signatories are from all around the world. The pledge has been translated into a number of languages. We currently have translations in Spanish, Portuguese, German, Italian and Czech. And many people are very generously coming forward and offering to translate it into different languages. Um, a recent initiative which um, we talked about in our last meeting, which I think is going to be really encouraging, is to gather examples of how individual mediators have chosen to change their practices as a result of signing the pledge. So we're going to add a page on WOMAC's website which shows these changes that have been made. For example, one senior mediator, and he'll only be able to put this into effect um, when we can all move about more freely, but one commitment he's chosen to make is that he will be far more discerning in the mediations which he chooses to do um, in the sense that he will, if it involves significant travel, if the parties do not want to use online technology and would like a mediator in person, then he will suggest a colleague who lives closer to where the mediation will be conducted. And I think that's hugely encouraging to see the community working together to reduce the community's collective environmental impact. And I think it's often easy to feel paralyzed by the enormity of the task and to also doubt the impact that our individual acts and changes can have. But um, I often think of a quotation that John Sturrock used in his mediation training from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. What we have to do, going back to Tolstoy's words, is we have to start with our own behaviours. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Anna. That's that's fantastic. That's really set the scene beautifully. Um, I must say, one of the things that a moderator loves is is when everybody speak uh, keeps to the timing pledge, which you've done brilliantly so far. So that that's a terrific start. Um, I just uh, we've got some questions coming in on on the Q and A. Um, as, as Ben mentioned, please put your questions on the Q and A. J chat is chat and, and exchange views, but the questions, please, on on the Q and A. But just before we come to those. I'd just like to ask Michelle actually. Um, Michelle, you're, you're in a, a big international law firm. Uh, so one question is how to minimize the environmental impact of a, a law office. Are, are, are things moving ahead in the big firms, uh, you know, slowly, quickly? I mean, just give us an idea of, of what's happening there. Certainly, and I think it's a, a great way um, us in the community of arbitrators, mediators have been looking at it uh, from the perspective of how do we run an arbitration or a mediation uh, in a more environmentally friendly manner. But I think it's, it's great for us to all think of that and then extrapolate it into our organisations, whether they're law firms, chambers, 
businesses more generally, um, institutions, as I'm sure Jamie will touch on when he speaks next. And I just think um, basically the bigger we can think, the better. And there are many firms that are looking at this seriously and introducing significant uh, policies. Some firms have even committed to being uh, zero, emitting zero uh, net emissions in the future. Some are saying that they're already doing so now. And some very large firms have made very significant commitments to this area. So what I thought I would do is outline um, a set of basic steps as to how you might be actually able to achieve this objective uh, within your firm. I think one of the first things working in a large organisation is to get the buy-in from senior management. And I think that that is absolutely critical. I also think now is an exceptionally opportune time to achieve that objective because many of the organisations are actually looking at the various savings that have occurred in relation to COVID and trying to determine to what extent those savings can actually be continued into the future. So I think dovetailing on that analysis, uh, coming from it from the greener um, or trying to achieve a, a lower carbon emission footprint is a great way to actually get that buy-in. Um, the second one is to get a committed team of enthusiastic participants. And I think as Anna was saying, you know, that, that is critical. And if you've got those people who are very interested in it, uh, then it's amazing what you can actually achieve. The third one is to do a detailed analysis of the firm or the particular officer's existing footprint. Now that can be a very time consuming and detailed uh, task, but having done that uh, with an office, it is actually achievable. But again, it does entail the buy-in of senior management and relevant people to provide all of the relevant data um, and some expertise in uh, Excel spreadsheets. Uh, the fourth one is to set very clear objectives um, over a particular time frame, whether that's one, two, three year period. And I would suggest looking at having targets for reducing carbon emissions uh, and then having that as a per person figure as well, uh, reducing paper usage um, and most importantly, reducing energy consumption. And I think if those are the three targets that an organisation initially sets itself, uh, it's, it's a very good way to introduce the relevant pol policies that are necessary for the reduction across those three areas. Um, there's obviously so many different ways that you can look at these three objectives. And there's so many ideas out there as to how to go about this. And indeed, obviously, the Greener Arbitration has a protocols for law firms, chambers, etc., which outlines very specific ideas on how this might be done. Uh, so I would encourage everybody to look at those and to think how their organisation might at least just start introducing some of these strategies. And then the final one is to measure and report regularly. And I think that that's actually critical, um, uh, that you have the baseline analysis and then you're continually measuring the change which is occurring via the various policies that you're introducing. Because that will obviously allow you to see progress, to not see progress, and then to adapt your relevant strategy to ensure that you're actually meeting those key objectives that the organisation has set itself. Now, um, obviously, that is a very quick way to do something that's very complicated. Uh, but I think that it's, it's obviously fantastic if we're keeping this in mind within the organisations that we're um, working in. But I also think that increasingly this will become a business imperative to do so. So many of our clients are um, either looking at this or have introduced uh, incredible policies uh, which go to um, the environment, but also more generally various 
ESG um, objectives. And indeed, the UK is making this a priority in a central piece of um, its objectives moving forward. And indeed, there's already um, reporting requirements on um, this issue. And we're also seeing the requirement for um, more enhanced reporting. So from 2022, uh, various entities, including listed companies, will have to disclose the extent to which their turnover, capital, and operating expenditure relates to environmentally sustainable activities. So it's definitely something that I think that our clients are going to be increasingly interested in. And we know that they're increasingly investing huge sums of money to achieve various objectives. So I think not only is it in our interest for what we're trying to achieve, but it's also uh, very much in a business sense, an interest for various law firms. And I think that we're increasingly seeing that with some of the statements which have been made from uh, numerous law firms. So I'll leave it at that for now. Nick. Okay, no, that, that's fantastic. You, you, uh, you've given us a sort of pointers and guidelines on, on some of the key points. That's fantastic. And, and anybody who wants to follow up any of those through the Q&A, please do, because there's plenty to chew on there. Um, I want to turn to Jamie Harrison and get a slightly different perspective then, because uh, uh, Jamie, you're, um, you're involved, of course, in, in, in running an important arbitral institution. So how do you see the, the role of the institutions in all this? Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, Nick. And um, uh, hello, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everybody who's, um, who's watching. I think it's uh, one of the huge benefits of, of this strange situation that we live in, that um, these kind of events are truly global um, and sort of relatively easily global. And it does show um, the impact that a virtual uh, event can have, um, particularly when you see the impact of, of flights, as Lucy um, described earlier. And um, I think it's, it's really great for us uh, uh, to be associated with this event uh, and also of course to have the opportunity to um, to co-host with the with the Chartered Institute so thank you Nick and and Ben on the front line but everybody else um, behind the scenes I think um, for us as an institution there are really two sides of the coin aren't there um, on the one hand there's our internal focus um, that we have as an organization like any small company managing our own operations in a in a sustainable and a, and a responsible way and I think we face uh, similar challenges to those just described by Michelle with respect to a law firm. We're not a law firm. Um, we, we're populated by a lot of lawyers, but we're not a law firm. Uh, but we do have a similar, um, uh, similar sort of issues to confront. And on the other hand, um, there's our external focus, um, the way that we as an institution administer the cases that our users um, bring to us, and that's arbitrations. Um, but of course, uh, not forgetting mediations too. Um, under the LCIA mediation rules um, and other forms of ADR um, and also of course the benefits and other opportunities that we offer our members uh, in terms of events uh, and other services so it's quite a complex picture for us. Um, I think on the internal front uh, I think the answer is we're doing the best we can. Uh, I think that probably like many uh, organizations uh, we have some way to go um, but I'm encouraged that if we judge ourselves by uh, the Green Protocol for Arbitral Institutions, which I have read and um, uh, digested, um, I think we've adopted the more obvious sustainable practices that um, we're encouraged to adopt. Um, we've reduced the use of paper, we encourage recycling, we discourage waste, uh, we communicate electronically, we use handheld tablets rather than notebooks, um, and we've banned single-use plastic. Uh, we operate a clean desk policy, not entirely successfully uh, in <laughs> some cases. Um, we've recently joined the cycle to work scheme. So we're, we're trying. Uh, but in all honesty, I think we'll struggle uh, to achieve much more. I think it, particularly in relation to energy consumption, while we remain in a very old energy inefficient building. I'm in it now, actually. Um, and I had to close the blinds because the view is so appalling. Um, but uh, I think it's probably a, a very badly kept secret that uh, the LCIA will move to new headquarters uh, later this year. Um, and what we plan in terms of our own refit uh, and infrastructure and the building within which we will uh, sit and the landlord 
that we have there um, will be a much more energy efficient uh, and I think will be much more responsive to our green aspirations than really we're able to achieve in, in, in this situation. Um, externally, I think um, I feel rather more encouraged uh, on that front, to be honest. Um, the, the green protocol for arbitral institutions um, is quite clear about what we should be doing uh, as an institution. Uh, we're asked to encourage the use of technology for the conduct of proceedings to minimize printing and use of paper where appropriate. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, especially given the amendments, the recent amendments to the LCIA rules, which came into effect on the 1st of October 2020, um, we're doing pretty well. Many of those amendments were in train before the pandemic hit. Um, but I think the uh, the provisions that we've brought in, um, the, the necessity of the provisions we brought in have only been, only been amplified by the experience um, of the pandemic. So we have specific new, new provisions in the rules allowing for electronic filing of requests, for signature and delivery of awards electronically, for composite requests and composite responses, for communication with the Secretariat by email only, for virtual hearings, uh, and more general reminders to arbitrators in the new Article 14.6 that they have extensive powers to make orders that will ensure exp expedition and efficiency of proceedings by shortening timescales, limiting evidence, restricting pleadings, and importantly, adopting technology uh, and even dispensing with hearings altogether. Um, so all of that is very consistent with the message of the Green Protocol uh, and is very much reflected in the revised mediation rules which came into effect uh, at the same time on the 1st of October um, and, um, and consistent with the, uh, the mediation pledge. Um, our programme of events, uh, which would normally involve a great deal of travel and face-to-face -face interaction has had to change uh, over the past year um, and has largely been replicated but online. Um, I personally believe, uh, a bit like the discussion about mediation, that there will always be a place for social uh, interaction and for meeting together to share knowledge and experience. But we've certainly learned um, that many events can be held virtually very successfully. Um, and today is a is testament to, to that, I think. Um, I do think, though, that in all this, it is important to remember that the role of an institution is really to facilitate the administration of disputes to set the framework within which the arbitrators and the parties can uh, hope to resolve them. Unlike some institutions, we don't operate a hearing centre or provide hearing services. Um, and so to that extent, we have no influence over how hearings are conducted, uh, other than, as I say, to give um, arbitrators relevant powers to dispense with them altogether, to shorten them or to have them virtually. We don't offer prescriptive advice or model orders for any aspect of our procedure, preferring to leave it to the arbitrators and the frameworks to set their own boundaries within the framework that the rules provide. Um, however, I think we do accept our obligation to lead by example and to ensure that our own practices are as sustainable as possible. And like I say, I think we're doing pretty well uh, on that front, but we have some way to go. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Um, like me, uh, I've been caught in a shaft of sunlight here I, I just regret that here in north london we don't have enough solar panels yet but you know we'll, we'll work on it um now the, the um i'm actually going to break the agreement uh not to add anything to the bios in the printed flyer but that who's going to stop me anyway um because um mia um hot off the press mia forbes piri uh, has just been awarded Independent Mediator of the Year for the United Kingdom by uh, Corporate International. So it would be remiss not to mention that and not to give you our warmest congratulations. Uh, of, of course, it means that you, you're speaking with even more authority than we knew you were before we, we got that news. But uh, I, I think you're going to um, look at it a little bit naturally, a little bit more from the mediator's perspective. So, but um, you know, what I want to ask you is, Looking at both pledges, and obviously ha having in, in mind what the others have said and so on, but looking at both the pledges, uh, do you feel they strike the right note, the right tone? Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you for your congratulations. Um, just just to give you a little bit of history about me to explain how I might be coming about some of this, I used to be a lawyer and then um, I, uh, I I wrote an email to everyone. I don't know if if, if you all remember when um, 
there was that thing, it's the economy stupid. And I wrote an email to everyone at Ashurst saying, it's the environment stupid. Uh, and I left and I went and studied environmental technology and I worked as an environmental consultant for the UK and the US government. And so now, as, as Nick has said, I'm a mediator. And so I'm kind of looking at this with, with multiple hats on. Um, and I guess how I came into this was when I found out about the Green Mediation Pledge, I was very excited about it and I was excited to want to be part of it. And I read the pledge and I thought, wow, can I meet these standards? And um, initially I thought, you know, I don't know if I can. And then I saw that Anna was involved and uh, I know Anna from a while ago. So, uh, you know, we got in touch and we started talking about it. And I think that th there's a difference in tone between the arbitration pledge and the mediation pledge. And I think the effect now that I've discussed it more and thought about it more is probably very similar. Um, but I think the tone has been, as, as Anna suggested, uh, presented a little bit differently and presented with a sort of a more, a, a sort of a, a higher standard on the, in the initial wording. And so I was one of those mediators who also wondered, is it my role to, to, to ask my clients about whether they should have single use plastic and, and where we should hold uh, mediation? And so having discussed this with Anna, and this is part of what I think I'd like to share to anyone else who might have had the same sort of apprehensions as I, I do, um, you know, you don't, there is a lot of flexibility in both pledges. And I think that one of the wonderful things about them is they really start you thinking. And they start you thinking about what your practices are and what your role is and what you can do, whether you're an organization, whether you're an individual. Um, and certainly in my household, we've had huge discussions um, at, off the back of this. Uh, so I, I think that is really life changing. And, and we were talking about with, with my partner about when he flies, he, he's a lawyer. Um, would he at least consider offsetting? So, you know, if you can't do everything, the question is, what can you do? Um, and what I, what I started thinking about is actually what I've been thinking about since I left Ashurst and since I took my master's was, how do I know what I need to do? How do I know where I can make the biggest impact? And I think that those are really difficult questions to answer. And so it's great to start and do something and to get involved and to start a conversation. And then it's useful to have a framework within which to think about these things and to, to understand a bit about the magnitude of what's possible. So uh, one of the reasons I'm here today is really to maybe contribute a little bit to that. And, and I'm, I've started to write a piece to help people with that. And Lucy may help me with that. And that would be great to help people have a bit more of that framework. And very much as Michelle was saying, I'm all about aligning incentives. She was talking about the buy-in uh, when there are savings. And I know that Michelle and Lucy have done fantastic research on you know what what are the impacts but what also are the financial savings so what are the benefits to you of putting in place measures that are helpful to the environment um, and I think that is is so important um, so I think I'll hand back with that but only to say that one of the wonderful things about this and the things I hope to contribute to is just raising awareness both of the pledges and of what's what's more important and what's less important so that we can have a bit of perspective when we're making decisions on an everyday basis no, that's great no we're getting us thinking is what it's all about you've got me thinking all right i'll tell you all of you um i have got we, we i'm delighted to say we, we have people from all over the world on, on 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 this event you know we have lots and lots of people who are enormously welcome including a, a, a friend of mine in baltimore paul i got him thinking the other day so paul i hope you're still thinking out there so um okay um now we do have some questions coming in um okay um a question from james is um is I'll, I'll just do it the way he he, he asks it he says is, is there a risk that that painting international arbitration as 
extravagant in the, in the way that Lucy describes will put commercial parties off when in fact um, the overwhelming majority of arbitrations, and I, I'm sure this will resonate with many people here, um, the overwhelming majority as alternatives to court litigation don't involve um, hearings uh, or not very big hearings, very often don't involve much travel, uh, sometimes are almost entirely online. Um, he, he just wonders whether arbitration as practiced by what he describes as the quiet majority, um, you know, whether arbitration perhaps has a slightly more positive green story to tell. Now, uh, I think probably this starts with you, Lucy, because your name has been taken in vain in this question. So, so let's, should we start with, with you, Lucy, and then uh, everybody else can chip in. Thank you, Nick. And, and yes, you know, one shouldn't be defensive about, about these things at all. Um, arbitration has an enormous amount of positives and the short answer is no, I don't think commercial parties are going to be put off um, at all. Nor do I think it's right to describe uh, the way arbitrations have been conducted historically and, and certainly right up to the pandemic as extravagant. Uh, law firms take uh, appropriate sensible reasonable decisions to to take deal with witnesses deal with their clients in 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 a certain way what i do think is important is for everyone to look at their practice whether that is a practice where you are doing two or three uh, 50 million dollar cases uh, at any one time or whether it's a practice where you're doing hundreds of, of smaller value disputes uh, which obviously are going to have a lower carbon footprint um, but regardless of the scale of your practice what the campaign is all about is about trying to educate, raise awareness, as, as uh, has been said, start a conversation and get people thinking about how, even if in those very small value disputes that may well be done online, there may be uh, no, no documents printed at all, are there is there still things you can do to make what is already going to be a smaller carbon footprint even smaller? Because everyone has to make a change and I cannot stress this enough we are in a climate emergency and uh, we are talking about trying to get to net zero as a, as a as a global community and in order to do that every single person on the globe has to do something and we in our very privileged arbitration community have a chance to do far more uh, than others. Um, so I think, I hope that answers James's question. Um, do, do come back if, if, it, if it hasn't. No, I'm sure that, that's great. I mean, I, and, and I think you're right. I mean, just as I'm sure Bill Clinton was right about the economy, Mia was right about the environment. The, um, Michelle, you, you've got experience in, in this particular area. Do you, do you want to add to, to what Lucy said? Yes, just in the sense of um, explaining the rationale for actually using that as an example. Um, and indeed, that is uh, entirely my fault because I wanted to, we wanted to make it exceptionally accurate. And so, therefore, we chose an arbitration uh, that we were working on so we could look at all of the, of the very detailed analysis of who was involved, what we were doing. And so we could come up with some accurate measurements. Now that um, arbitration is a relatively large arbitration, but actually is very reflective of all of the arbitrations that I've ever worked on. Um, so it definitely is coming from that perspective of a larger arbitration, but I do think that that reflects uh, some of the arbitration which is coming out of some of the larger firms. So it is obviously not representative of every arbitration, um, but it indeed does highlight the um, extensive carbon footprint of a medium to large size arbitration, which I think is important for us in order to determine what the possible worst case scenario is and then how we can actually reduce that. So indeed, it's not meant to be a reflective figure of every arbitration um, that's existing around the globe. And indeed, we're fully aware of that. Uh, and the Greener Arbitration um, Committee is actually 
trying to um, undertake a more extensive survey so we can come up with more reflective figures for various sizes of arbitrations. If I yeah, could okay. add yeah, sorry. That, yep. If I could just add to that, yeah. I think yeah, really, please. From a, from a sort of perspective of looking at where you're having an effect and, and where you can have an impact, it makes perfect sense to start with what is going to be the most energy consuming, the most use, use, using kind of arbitration. And then, as Michelle has said, to look at other ones afterwards. So it sounds like a really sensible approach. And I think, you know, the what James talked about, the, the word uh, extravagant, um, it's funny, my con I've, in conversation with Lucy, she's really made me think about this, because it's not necessarily that something is extravagant, there can be unnecessary waste, and waste that really doesn't contribute to anything. So it may be that printing is not the worst uh, sort of environmental sin that you can commit, but when you have a hundred lever arch files behind you and they're not being used, um, you know, query whether that's necessary, whether that's helpful to anyone, and it's just waste. And sort of going back to the benefits aspect, I, I was talking to a, a QC yesterday who was saying to me, you know, when we go back into court, I don't know what I'm going to do because I really like electronic bundles. And I prefer working in many ways off electronic bundles. So there are some real win-wins here where we can just, it's not like we can't print anything, but where we can avoid printing hundreds of LibreArch files that we're never going to look at and instead use a sort of more efficient, maybe print one file of these are the key documents and have everything else accessible electronically. So, so I think, yeah, it's not necessarily about being extravagant. It can be looked at as what is really unnecessary and is it a win-win to get rid of? Jamie, um, I, I just wonder you because you you see, <clears throat> you know, at the, the LCIA, obviously you do see a very wide range of, of disputes, you know, from the, the gigantic disputes to you know the other end of the spectrum. So uh, you don't have to, but I wonder if you'd you'd like to add comments from your perspective on this. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I think it's important for us as an institution to to dispel the myth um, that, uh, you know, that arbitration is is extravagant. I'm sorry, James, to keep um, coming back to the word you used, but um, extravagant, I think, is a, you know, it's an unfortunate word. I think, um, certainly from our perspective, there, there, there is, uh, there are mechanisms within the rules <clears throat> by which um, costs and resources and waste uh, can be controlled um, and reduced. And I also think the impression of, of arbitrations as, you know, great bloated, uh, proceedings with hundreds of people and loads of documents is probably misrepresentative of the of the truth. Um, a small example is that that you know 50% of the uh, cases that we handle at any one time are single arbitrator cases as opposed to a three arbitrator tribunal. So the traditional image of an arbitration with three um, uh, arbitrators and all the all the paraphernalia that goes with it is probably un, unrepresentative. Um, but I as a uh, I joined the LCIA in the last couple of years and until that was a you know practicing arbitration lawyer um, charged with marketing arbitration um, uh, to uh, to unsuspecting clients and I think it would be terrific if we could get to the point where we can expand the traditional pillars of of marketing of arbitration of you know confidentiality and speed and commercial responsiveness and include environmentally friendly in there um, I think would be um, would be a great result. Yeah, that's great. just a matter of interest. I mean, if, if if you know off the top of your head, but uh, can you say, I mean, roughly of, of the arbitrations that the LCI handles, um, uh, can you say roughly what sort of percentage actually get to a hearing on the on the merits? Um, good question. Uh, we have been doing quite a lot of analysis on the the process, the case process, um, for all our our cases, um, and it's it's really hard to see a consistent trend. But I think you can. I think you can say that a that a remarkable number um, are settled during the course of the process and don't reach the full uh, don't don't go the full way. I mean, I should think upwards of a quarter of cases 
um, file don't uh, don't make it all the way to a final hearing. Yeah. Okay. Um, we also, of course, Sorry. We, we, we do, of course, have uh, new mechanisms for early determination as well. It's not all about settlement, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, the full lifespan of a case is 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 certainly the norm. Um, but uh, yeah, there are exceptions. Okay. Um, no, a, a, a diff different question. I mean, uh, interesting thought. Um, um, Kim Franklin has has just asked. She, she wonders whether the increased use of, of technology. Um, uh, raises the risk of, of the dispute resolution process being hacked. You know, she's saying, is does mm. paper does paper keep it more secure? Uh, uh, can I jump, jump in on that one, Nick? Because yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, on yeah. it's a great point, but it's also a very important point. Um, uh, if if everything was done on paper, Kim your point would be absolutely right. But the issue we have is that everything is not done on paper. Everything is communicated electronically and then printed. So what the campaign is trying to do is to reduce, again, back to pick up on Mia's point, waste underpins everything really we're talking about today. And we're, we want you to reduce the amount of duplication because you will be receiving documents electronically and obviously as you rightly point out that has uh, enormous and very important implications from a cyber security perspective but asking you to print less or not print everything by default just pick and choose um, is really to reduce uh, and eliminate that that aspect of duplication um, so, so I hope that answers answers your point. I do think it's a very, very good point, Kim. Um, but I'm afraid we're already in an environment where everything is exchanged electronically, and therefore we have to have all the cybersecurity uh, in place um, as much as possible, anyway. Um, so, if we could go back to entirely paper, we would avoid that. But we, we that's long gone, I'm afraid. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm actually told I, I'm not actually. You know, I'm not monitoring the chat. I'm monitoring the Q and A. But I did notice on the chat that somebody's telling us that the the photocopying costs for litigation over litigation this was over the new Wembley Stadium. That photocopying costs were a million pounds. So <laughs> that's kind well, of. I mean, the, that's extraordinary, but also just on the costs, this is something that Mia touched upon um, and Michelle's and her team's uh, incredible research early on in the campaign also included a costs element. And this is something we haven't yet had a chance to really publish our findings on, but I will give you the headline figure that rerunning our numbers on what we called our green basis, which were fairly conservative, I have to say, uh, and Michelle I'm sure would agree with me, all we did to rerun those numbers was to eliminate hard copy uh, printing of, of the bundles and to take one less flight at every stage of the arbitration and that resulted in what we call our our 40 tons of carbon dioxide um, equivalent was gone but it very importantly almost 40 percent of disbursement costs were cut so back to Mia's point, this is a way of running things more efficiently and more cost effectively. And I think as we come out of the pandemic, that's going to then there's going to be big, big squeeze on legal spend. And I think this is something that we we very much have on our radar in terms of publicizing that element of, of behaving more in a more environmentally friendly way. I think that's so important to, to make people aware of these figures like a million pounds in photocopying and being able to save 40% because we really do want this. I mean, it's wonderful to do things for the environment altruistically, but we want people to have as many incentives as they possibly can to do things. So the more people can be aware of figures like that and where they have the biggest impact, both financially and environmentally, the more they can, the more likely they are to make better decisions. Mm -hmm. If, if I could just come in there, I think yeah, with, Anna, the, please, yeah. with the pledges, they can only ever be general principles and they're sort of foundational principles. And what I'm particularly looking forward to with the mediation pledge is gathering these examples of concrete changes, um, what mediators have chosen to do and sharing that with the community. Because people will, they, 
Some people will interpret wherever possible narrowly. Some people will interpret it broadly. Um, and that's their prerogative. And we, we can't, nor should we, police how that is um, interpreted. But the, the pledges are offered very much to encourage meaningful change. And I think we do need to err on the side of, of raising the bar because if we place it too low, then it's not going to result in any change. Um, Jamie. Nick, I, 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 um, I agree with that. Um, I think it's really important to set the bar high and to give everybody aspirations. I think contrary, slightly contrary to that, I, I would say to everybody not to, be, um, not, not to be too overly focused on the pledge, uh, the respective pledges, as the sort of pinnacle of what you need to achieve. I've been, um, this is, a, this is a, uh, one, um, uh, an advert for, for, for Lucy. Um, I've, I've been really struck having really focused on the green protocols, how terrific they are at giving you the tools to equip yourself to think about the pledge more seriously, to get you to that point. Um, there are some really easy steps to take. Uh, and, and I think in preparing for this um, uh, seminar, one of the things that struck me was that, there, that we should bring the practices that Lucy described at home, you know, we all recycle, we all uh, aspire to electric cars, we all turn the lights off, we all uh, do all of that, and we should bring that to work. Uh, and it is a very simple, relatively simple process. And the protocols, I think, are really helpful in focusing your mind on that. Um, and, and, you know, the, the pledge is the, is the icing on the cake, but the protocols will really help to get you there. Hmm. Do, do you think that, um, I mean, the question, and it's been touched on in the, in the Q&A and chat and so on, but um, do you think that there may be some positive pressure to come from those who are actually paying for litigation and arbitration? You know, I don't know about third party funders and, and then shipping the, you know, the defence clubs, the, the P&I clubs. Uh, of course, the parties themselves have an interest. But, but do you think there may be some positive pressure there and um, perhaps a, a little bit that these things might be taken into account more in cost budgeting? So who, who, who wants to, who, who's got the, wants to deal with that perhaps? Um. I, I think that's a very important um, way to put positive pressure. And I know that uh, a lot of people who, who work in, in sort of what was corporate social responsibility always has new names, but um, the way that they get big changes happening in a lot of businesses is, is by talking about the cost benefits because people are used to talking in terms of their bottom line but i also think sort of what anna and what jamie are saying in terms of in terms of storytelling and the importance of you know having real examples it is is vital and 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 just beginning somewhere and i think it's good to begin somewhere but then to have a bigger framework within which to be able to see you know both in terms of costs and in terms of of energy use or environmental impact where it, what are the things that are going to be big hitters and what are the things that are going to not make so much difference and, and really basic things like you know having in mind even when you're looking at waste the waste hierarchy which starts with reducing before you reuse and recycle and we often think as recycling because we recycle at home as the headline but actually the headline is reduce use less and then if you can reuse and then recycle as a sort of a almost last resort so so i think there are some basic principles and a basic framework that it's important for people to be aware of and, and as jamie was saying some of that is is very helpful in 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 the in the protocols to the to the arbitration pledge yeah jamie i mean you you obviously keep a careful eye on arbitration costs and so on from from the lci perspective and so on do, do, you, do you think that the you know cost budgeting is is you know should be used more and has a, a really positive role here um i think um that is always going to be a matter for the arbitrator and the uh, uh, you know the tribunal and the, and the parties um, I think we uh, we encourage and empower uh, arbitrators to be uh, very tight uh, on costs and on and on waste. Um, it would struck me actually that Mia talking about the sort of process of getting to recycling. Um, you know, we we are often asked, for example, why we don't have a a model policy on data 
protection um, and uh, information security. And the truth is we leave it to the parties to, um, to, to manage that themselves. We don't prescribe uh, the manner in which they should, they should proceed. But the, but the rules empower the parties um, to take it even a stage earlier than what Mia was talking about, which is not to produce that stuff at all. Uh, you know, to reduce the scope of disclosure, to redact documents and to, uh, you know, reduce the scale of, of, of witness statements and, and experts reports, etc. So I think there is an element of that active case management and cost management in the process uh, in any event, and we would expect the parties um, to, you know, to encourage that. I think there's a lot of pressure from, from uh, uh, clients, not only on costs, but on, but on sustainability. I think it's a really obvious um, thing. If you've ever been in a law firm that's looking for a panel reappointment, you know that that's a significant um, issue. Um, and of course, in the LCIA's case, there is the, the backstop of the LCIA court, which will uh, clamp down on excessive um, costs. And if, uh, you know, if we can, if we can reduce them at all, we will. Uh, but certainly more sustainable practices should be encouraged, I think, at every stage. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Adrian with Stanley, he puts in the question, of course, you know, in a perfect world, there would be no disputes, but um, it'd be terribly disappointing for those of us that like doing arbitration, but, you know, we'd do something harmless, like keep bees or something like that, wouldn't we? But the, but Adrian is, is asking, he says, shouldn't there be a, a drive by everybody involved in, in, well, dispute resolution or alternative dispute resolution and so on towards a, more of a culture of dispute avoidance and effective techniques for early settlement, you know, early neutral valuation, all that sort of stuff and so on, um, to, to minimise the environmental impact of the disputes being there in the first place or dispute resolutions happening. It's a bit, a bit of a big question and, uh, you know, this may be a nirvana that, you know, is going to be out of reach for quite a while. Um, what, what do you think, Lucy, what do you think about that? <laughs> I, don't, I don't, uh, I mean, I obviously think, I see the point that Adrian's trying to make, but uh, there will always be lawyers, law firms, people involved in dispute resolution. And, and the, the idea is really not to try and minimize our carbon footprint where as, a, as an industry, it's simply to look on a piece by piece basis and see what each of us as individuals can do to reduce our impact of, of our practices on the environment. Um, we, we're not, I mean, when I talk on this topic, I, I usually make the point that as dispute resolvers, we don't have a vast carbon footprint, that, that's for sure. You know, we are not a uh, transport industry, we're not cement makers, we're manufacturers, we're, we're none of those things. Um, so so I, I, I take Adrian's point, but um, I think it, it is more incumbent upon all of us to really examine our professional lives and to see where we can make a difference uh, on this. And anybody else on that um, about maybe a mediation perspective on that? Mia, got anything to add? I think Anna wants to say something, and then I'd like to add something. Okay, no, well, Anna, please. Yep. Yeah, so echoing Louis, Lucy's point, it's doing what doing what we can where we can. So I think it is also a very important aim to try to reduce the amounts of disputes and and perhaps when people engage in mediation, they learn techniques that to help them to avoid disputes in the future so they learn collaborative techniques um, but that's a much larger goal that might take a lot longer so it's about doing what we can where we can and, and, and realistically and so we can make a change coming back to our own individual practices to minimize our environmental impact in the way in which we conduct our mediations okay um no we've got a question it, it's anonymous so i'm afraid i can't give the questioner a name, can I? Um, but we've got a, an anonymous attendee who, who's asked this. Um, how can the arbitration... Um, sorry, excuse me one second. I just have to... Something's come up to block off his question. How can the arbitration community uh, leverage or leverage, depending on your, your taste, uh, on blockchain technology uh, to reach net zero emissions? And are there any associated risks? Um, picking Michelle I, I sort of think you're first up on this one 
I was really hoping that you weren't going to pick me. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm just, I, I'm trying to be Mr. Nice Guy, but I have picked you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I have to admit, I could not answer that with um, uh, any authoritative detail, I'm afraid, but hand it over to the remainder of the panel who might be able to do a better job on that one. Can, can well, I I'm not, I'm like, yeah, this, go on then, Mia. Oh, a, a volunteer, that's what I like. On, this Mia, side Mia. question, I think another anonymous attendee, possibly the same anonymous attendee, asked us, has anybody checked the impact of the, all of this technology on the environment just asking so that we're not getting onto even riskier pathways yeah. and i think that's a really um interesting question which ties into the blockchain and i'm afraid i do know a lot about technology but i'm not uh, a, an expert on blockchain um i think there's been a lot in the press and, and this is one of the things that is important to me to bring out there's been a lot in the press about how you know when ronaldo tweets um you know people reading the tweet or watching his little video is using the, uh, the the same amount of energy as a small country in Africa. And in sort of reliable press like Thomson Reuters, The Guardian, The Financial Times, uh, places like that. And I have even facilitated discussions among uh, sort of people, including professors who I've heard cite this. And in looking into this, so thank you to, to everyone here for making me so interested in this. Um, I, what I've found out is that that's just bad maths. It's basically uh, a bottom up calculation based on old information. And when you look top down, there have been huge advances in server technology and in storage. And basically, stor data storage takes about 1% of the world's electricity use. And that has remained pretty constant, even though we are increasing the number of things that we are storing. So there's a lot in the press about this that is misleading. Um, and partly, I think, as Lucy was saying, it's not as though at the moment we really have a choice. It's not as though we can sort of, we're going to say, oh, well, let's just write everything on a piece of paper by hand, right? We are storing this data and we are then printing it so the question is do we need that extra step and of course can we maybe minimize and reduce the, the number of times we send the same document uh, but but really it, the the data storage is not as bad as it has been portrayed to be it, it is a big impact but it's not as bad and yeah. th thanks Mia. can i just jump in on that as well just to say that the campaign has has very much got this notion of our digital carbon footprint on our radar um, and we we hope very much this year to be pr um, publishing some sort of helpful guidance to do the sort of things that Mia says make sure you're not sending the document around lots of times be careful how many people you're um, cc'ing on an email don't write thanks and send it to a hundred people um, because I think people people are, are sort of aware that uh, there is a digital carbon footprint and there absolutely is um, but we may not be aware that there's certain things that we can do sitting sitting in front of our computers to to actually reduce um, reduce it so so we, we it, it's it's on it's on our radar is all is, is all I have to say on that okay well, I must say, when I when I saw the word blockchain, I, I said a little prayer of thanks that I'm the moderator and don't have to answer the questions. So, uh, okay. Um, I just I was I was one one thing actually, just going back really to some of your very interesting comments at the beginning, um, Michelle. Um, in in a in, in a law firm, um, is is are these changes and policies and so on, how far? are they and should they be set from the top and how far because you know you've got your big partners at the top and then you've got you know i don't mean disparagingly you've got minions in every organization haven't you um so you know who where, where's the push got to come from uh, I think that's a fantastic question. I do think that some law firms have progressed along these ob objectives far faster than others have. And I think that the differentiating factor is precisely that point I first made, the buy-in of the leaders. 
And I think that actually with any organisational change, and we've seen this in relation to diversity, for example, if the example has been set from the senior leaders and the objective is being put forward for the business from the senior leaders, then change often happens a lot faster. Having said that, I often think that you get that buy-in from the minions or the people who are enthusiastic, continually raising this as an issue or as an idea or finding opportunities to approach senior people and to get them interested. And why should they be interested? I think you really have to phrase it in terms of why this person might actually start thinking about that. And so often um, when we say, oh, it should be, we should have more diversity or we should change the business in this way because of this reason. So for example, if we were looking at this, we should change it so we have less of a carbon footprint. You'll often get the answer, the question of why. And I think if you have a, con a convincing narrative around why, which is unfortunately not just that because we should, because we should help the planet, um, you will often get a better response because it will resonate. And I think if you can put it in terms of how that might help the business, look at the cost saving, look at the leadership, look at meeting client needs, better servicing clients, being able to be on their um, on par with them in terms of their key objectives and what they're implementing. I think it's a very different narrative. Um, and so I think I would encourage everybody to address it from that perspective um, as well, is my view. Can I just jump in Hello. there? Yeah, building on Michelle's point about the why, it comes back to Lucy's opening comments about how she saw that her clients were changing more quickly than, um, than the arbitration community and, and ultimately it might come down to a lot of push from clients and that's going to be quite a persuasive technique that whilst um, various dispute resolution processes may not have as much of environmental impact I think the question they may ask is how is it not relevant to you it might be a little less relevant but it's still relevant and that's the question we'll have to answer we can't simply say oh we don't have much of an environmental impact so we're not doing anything about it mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, of course, we, we've all learnt, um, you know, new ways of doing things. I mean, it, it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good at all. So, you know, over the last year, we've all learnt these new ways, which, of course, we're implementing here today. And it has advantages of far more people being able to participate and so on. But, but I, you know, a question I'm sure is in the back of all our minds, actually, is, um, is, is there a risk that will, you know, I say when all this is over, I mean, I'm, taking a sort of positive slant I mean you know some sort of approximation to, to life as we once knew it Did, uh, how much of a risk is that, that we're just going to slip back into old habits and patterns do you, do you see a positive or a, a negative uh, view on on that one um, Jamie why don't I start with you Um, really good question. I mean, I, I, I think sometimes I'm quite pessimistic about this, uh, this question and I think it'd be terribly easy for us all. We've all been very good at saying, uh, what well, you know, when we return to normal, I am going to work remotely. I am going to still see my children. I am going to, um, still go to the gym, all that, all that stuff, uh, alongside my working day. I think, you know, I waste a lot of time commuting and all of that. Um, I think a lot of it, uh, will be about leading from the top. I think, you know, people like me responsible for, um, uh, staff who uh, you know need to be empowered to 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 run their lives in that way need to to look to me to to set that example. Um, I think we're going to be expected to do it. I think you know if we offer employment to people that that will be a, a, a an you know an expectation that people have to work remotely and to um, travel less perhaps um, or work flexibly. Um, so uh, I think we may be. Um, uh, there may be a possibility, a tendency to slip back, but the, I, I think there's enough of a, a following wind. I think people have seen, in particular, this kind of technology really can work. I said right at the start that, you know, I think it's really impressive the, the global reach that we have, if nothing else, 
um, it saves everybody a lot of time, uh, not least the speakers um, who can you know, prepare and, um, uh, and, and present um, and the attendees, uh, etc. It's just a very efficient way of, of doing it. And the technology has really improved, I think, over the last year. So mixed picture, I really hope we don't slip back, but I think it's up to people like us to lead the way. Lucy, positive or negative? Well, it, it is funny. I don't know if anyone can see my little badge here, which is a little aeroplane badge. Um, okay. And I, I bought hundreds of these badges back in 2019 when I when I first uh, mooted this idea of my green pledge. And I said uh, that I would I would post anyone a, a, a little badge um, if they would if they told me they had not taken a flight for environmental reasons and so this was about towards the end of 2019 and in january 2020 i was mailing badges off to all over the place a couple went to australia paris you name it and and then of course the pandemic hit and i have not sent any badges out because everyone has been not getting on planes um, because they haven't been allowed to so it, it's quite ironic looking at that but i think what the the pandemic has shown us and this I think is the real important point is that we have been able to change quickly we have I think we were surprised ourselves how we have all pivoted to these kind of online platforms how hearings went virtual and we are a community who really like to talk about things a lot before we do them and we 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 are all tend to be slightly resistant to change we're, we're cautious by nature uh, and in in my career in the last sort of 20 25 years you change has happened but it has been at a fairly glacial rate and I go back to my point we are in a climate emergency we do not have time to spend the next to spend time the next 10 years or so discussing what we're going to do to be more environmentally friendly and so for me, the pandemic has shown us that we can pivot quickly and we can adapt and we can change. Will we slip back? I, I think we, uh, there are certain things that is absolutely unarguable that they are better done in person and that's absolutely fine. But I, I think we have hit a real um, opportunity here and, and my optimistic side says, well, no, we're not going to go back. This has been the biggest change in my practice uh, that I've ever seen. And uh, I think we will only build upon it from now. Anna, positive or negative? I share Lucy's hopes. I, I think we've seen that we can do it and we can change quickly. Um, I think also maybe a, this experience with COVID has brought to bear what we might be facing. This is nothing compared to what we will face um, with the change from climate change, the, the book recently by Bill Gates, you know, that it, we, you know, we never thought we would experience this kind of situation and, and now we are. And, and so that maybe that will make for some people the prospects of, of the consequences of climate change seem more realistic. Um, so I remain optimistic. I, I agree. I think it needs, it needs leadership. But similarly, I think a lot of, you know, I've been really heartened to see a lot of the younger generation actually inspiring, um, and I, you know, the older generation, I include myself in that. Um, so, you know, from both levels, both top down and, and bottom up, we need everyone doing what they can, where they can. And as lawyers, you know, we tend to spend hours discussing the meaning of words and perhaps their consequences, and, it, and it's time we, we take more action. Yeah. He doesn't need any publicity from me, but Bill Gates' new book does look quite interesting, actually. Um, uh, so, uh, Michelle, positive, I haven't asked you, have I? Positive or negative? Yeah, go on. No, you've not, but can I actually use my time to say something else? Because I agree yes, you, with what everybody's you, you, already said, you, you, so I won't you, be adding any value in that respect. You, you can, indeed. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Just yeah. in relation to yeah. the greener arbitration, as Lucy yeah. mentioned, we do want to start looking further into the digital um, footprint of arbitrations. So if there's anybody out there who has looked at this or has particular expertise, uh, in this, please do let us know because we would love to hear from you uh, and to receive some help on this. Okay. Um, a, a question that's been raised is, is 
do you think at the moment i mean this is this is a, a you know a really sort of delicate thing do you think at the moment um we're getting the right balance of um encouragement and policing you know because I mean, clearly you you know you 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 can't just go telling everybody what to do all the time and prescribing to them and so on but do, do, do you think we got the got the balance right there um actually i'll start with you again jamie if i may because you know you're, you're you're an institution so you have rules and i suppose also the question of how far <coughs> rules can help on this yeah, it's interesting. I think, um, I mean, we're often asked in this context, you know, is there, is there a role for um, the institution perhaps in the, in the disclosure process, the arbitrator disclosure mm -hmm. process yeah, that, to say, um, yeah. I mean, I was asked yesterday whether there was scope in that process to, to get arbitrators to tick a box to say that they were computer literate, but I, I, <laughs> I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure how uh, popular that would be. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to, to uh, to request a, a confirmation of a willingness to uh, adhere to the green protocol, the relevant green protocol, for example, or, or you know, even to have signed the pledge. Um, I, I, I think that's a step, quite a big step for us. I think we prefer, as I said earlier, to um, provide the framework within which parties, arbitrators can frame their uh, proceedings consistent with the, uh, with the, with the protocols. Um, I think it might be useful for uh, parties, uh, you know, if arbitrators had a, we talked a bit about a sort of green, green mark, green stamp, um, showing their willingness to, to um, adhere to the, the principles of the protocol, perhaps that might be helpful. Um, but I don't think from our perspective, we're at the stage of, of you know, validating or, or, or you know, requiring uh, those sort of confirmations from, from arbitrators or parties. I think we'd encourage them to to, to stick to the protocols. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Anna, sorry. I mean, I mean, Anna, you you know, your 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 the the pledge, you know, that you've been talking about, you're involved with. I mean, clearly that that, you know, that that's in terms of encouragement, isn't it? And 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 so on. But th so, do you think overall then, the the as far as you can. See the the balance is being got roughly right between prescription and encouragement. So I think it's a, it's an encouragement. It's, there's, it's not it's not a prescription. There's no obligation um, to sign up to the pledge. There's there is flexibility within it. But what we are encouraging is that mediators use it. It's a foundation. So we mentioned in the introductory wording. It's a foundation, and please feel free to augment and adapt it. So mediators can take it how might that work in practice or they could take the pledge sign it and then if they would like to amend the wording they can amend the wording and publish the amended pledge on their own website um, but i think as regards sort of prescription or policing i think a more effective way is actually to celebrate good good practice good leadership good behavior so for example i saw lucy's um work for green green arbitrations uh, was nominated for a gar award so actually rather than try to call out bad behavior let's really try to raise publicity and shine a light on good practices good leadership mm -hmm. by the way I, jamie yeah. sorry yeah uh, no no i was just going to say if i can just build on that because i i think yeah. there's enormous goodwill in the community um but what we Face is, is perhaps a, a lack of an awareness first, then perhaps a lack of understanding about what what people can do, which is where where the green protocols came in. And one thing I'm going to start working on uh, when I sort of give up sleep officially um, is is the notion of green swaps, which are a bit like diet swaps. You know, don't don't eat that hamburger, eat this instead, sort of idea. Because I think people really want to do something, they just don't know what to do. And so my my idea for my these green swaps would be, you know, don't do don't don't do this, to consider this instead. Um, and so I, I I think Anna's absolutely right. This is this is about carrots more than sticks and um, building on on people's desire to change. Okay, that's great. Um... Jamie, on, on your bit about the box, you know, ticking the computer literacy box, um, won't it be unpopular with those who aren't computer literate and popular with those who are? So maybe it's a good 
box. Maybe it's a good box to have. <laughs> no, but um, but look, I mean, I, I apologise to anybody in the the Q and A who whose question we haven't got round to because we had we had a late flurry of questions. We suddenly jumped up in in numbers enormously. So uh, we 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 are coming to the the end of the allotted time. So I'm gonna hand back to Ben in a moment. I suppose the only thing is, I mean, I, I've used this quip before in among our colleagues, but um, uh, you know, with apologies to anybody who's not heard of the Muppets, which probably is a minority of the, the attendees at this session. Um, you know, the guru of all is, is Kermit the Frog, isn't he? Who, who just tells us it's not easy being green. So, um, and you know, it, it, it is a challenge. It's not, it's not that easy, but, um, but it's been it's made easier enormously by the contributions of, of, of those involved on this panel and, and I'm sure others who've attended this meeting. So um, thank you very much indeed um, for all of you, uh, from, from all of you. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot on blockchain, but um, you know that was, uh, that was absolutely terrific. Thank you. So uh, nothing more from me at all. I'm, I'm going to hand back to to my chairman. Thanks, Nick, and just add my thanks as well. It's been a fantastic discussion. Uh, so thank you to all of you for your uh, wonderful contributions. And there's been fantastic engagement as well from everyone in the chat and on the Q and A. It, it, it is it's not the same as doing this in a seminar room, but um, there has at least been quite a lot of engagement in, in the topic. It's, it's very much a hot hot topic. Um, just to, uh, oh, and also thank you very much to the RCIA for um, co-hosting this webinar with with us. Uh, we very much appreciate our ongoing relationship with the RCIA. We do these webinars every year. This particular webinar was actually postponed from last September because of the pandemic. Uh, but we look forward to our next webinar, which uh, hopefully is going to be next September, back, back in our normal September slot.